It's Tuesday, it's 12.15 and we're live in Westminster. Joining me today, Conservative MP Ben Bradley, Shadow Leader of the House, Thangham Debonair, Sonia Soda from The Observer, and Camilla Tomini from The Telegraph. Today, we're used to seeing the Queen for the state opening of Parliament. This year, it's her son and heir setting out the legislative agenda. Her Majesty's government's priority is to grow and strengthen the economy and help ease the cost of living for families. But will any of the bills mentioned by Prince Charles help bring down living costs? We can't spend our way out of this problem. Uh, we have to grow our way out. We know that people are struggling. People are watching this morning will know how tough it is. Questions this morning for Keir Starmer after yesterday's big gamble. If the police decide to issue me with a fixed penalty notice, I would, of course, do the right thing and step down. And is the plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda about to be scuppered in the courts? We have such a formidable army of politically motivated lawyers who for years have made it their business to thwart removals and frustrate the government. Let's start with the state opening of Parliament, an extremely important major constitutional event in the calendar and duty of the Queen setting out the government's fresh legislative agenda. You can see the motorcade arriving here just over an hour ago, except this year it was completely different because the Queen wasn't in attendance. Because of what Buckingham Palace have called episodic mobility issues. A slightly unusual phrase. She is the Queen, after all, 96 years old. But it is quite a moment uh, that this important duty has fallen to the Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, instead, accompanied here by the Duchess of Cornwall as they arrived at Parliament before making that procession to the House of Lords. Uh, the Duke of Cambridge was also in attendance. Um, Camilla, Tomini, we can't really underestimate how profound this moment is because apart from two other occasions when the Queen was pregnant, she's never missed the state opening of Parliament. Exactly. And actually the word unprecedented is overused these days, but this is something we haven't seen before because when she was pregnant, she delegated to the Lord Chancellor. She's used this letter's patent to delegate to her son and heir. You've seen the Prince William there because what the palace was trying to say is they're in a dual supporting role. And I think it was important to note the use of the words Her Majesty's government. This wasn't Prince Charles taking control and saying my government, which was what royal watchers were looking at. This is a kind of one off move because she wasn't able to attend today. But ultimately, for those watching, it does provide a glimpse of the future. And equally, it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Because I think people watching it are seeing all of the pomp and pageantry that we're used to, mm. but without the jewel in the crown. Literally, in that sense. Um, the crown, of course, was there um, with all its jewels and in all its finery. But we can see um, Prince Charles, the Duke of Wales, um, entering into the chamber before he did actually read out uh, the list of bills. As you say, Camilla, uh, because you've been covering the royals for years, um, there will be a sense that he has taken over, but he hasn't, of course, in this sense. He is filling in uh, yes. for his mother, for the Queen. This was a one-day-only event, and the palace has been keen to stress that the Queen will see the Prime Minister probably virtually on Wednesday. She will carry on doing her audiences when she can. They are taking every decision they're making on a day-to-day -day basis. The fact that they took this decision down to the wire and there was a similar response when she had to pull out of the Cenotaph last November at the very last minute, this is because the Queen wanted to be there, mm. but she can't. And what they're trying to avoid at the age of 96 for a woman who's got problems with her hips and her knees, any long periods of standing and any long distance walking. And at the end of the day, that procession is at least 50 yards. Well, she's not capable of doing that today. So regrettably and regretfully, she's had to pull out. Glimpse of the future, Sonia, is that uh, your impression? 
Well, it clearly is, isn't it? Because, you know, the Queen is 96. And in some ways, it's amazing that um, mob mobility issues that she's had thus far have <laughs> interfered so little Absolutely. with her performing her duties. I mean, I expect she works kind of longer hours than most of us in this room. So, yes, it is a glimpse of the future. And I'm sure, um, you know, it's horrible to sort of have to project forwards and, and think about these mm. things with a monarch as well loved as the Queen. But I'm sure the royal family is kind of thinking through what the implications are, because obviously the Queen is in incredibly popular um, and I think Prince Charles doesn't command quite those same levels of, of affection although maybe that will change. Uh, we can see here the Queen uh, presiding over her first state opening of Parliament um, in the Queen's carriage there on the 4th of November 1952. The, the, the pomp and pageantry, well there's nothing quite like it uh, for the state opening uh, of Parliament and as we said she has only missed it on two other occasions in 1959 and in 19 1963, when she was pregnant with Prince Andrew and then later Prince Edward. Um, your impressions, Ben? It was very strange, I think. It shows, these pictures show the, the longevity and the incredible lifetime of service that she's offered the country. But as Sonia said, um, you know, the fact that we're only now at the age of 96 starting to think yeah. about what if she can't do this, that and, and other parts of her duties uh, just shows how driven she clearly is to, to be out there. But obviously, you know, if, if you can't walk, if you're not mobile, then it's just not possible. But yeah, perhaps a glimpse into the future, one we're all going to have to get used to at some stage. Um, strange day, though. Profound moment. A profound moment, but also I think we're still all looking forward to celebrating her jubilee. And I think, you know, the people are planning street parties. We're looking forward to, I'm sure people are looking forward to the two bank holidays. But most yeah, of all, sure they are. Sure they are. <laughs> but I think we're also looking forward to celebrating the Queen's life of service. It is an incredible life of service to think that it is nearly 60 years since she last missed one. That is quite something. OK, well, let's actually have a look at the substance, or some of it at least, of the Queen's speech. The official state opening of Parliament has now happened. Um, setting out the government's plans, they would like to see it as a reset, um, but setting out the laws that it would like to pass. Today it included, we think, uh, about 38 bills to deal with issues um, such as energy and Channel 4 privatisation and, of course, the economy. Everybody has been talking about the cost of living. What was there specifically, Ben, though, in the Queen's speech and those bills that's actually going to help people pay their household bills? Well, I think there's there's a lot in there. It's Is clear that? that we need to focus on uh, long-term growth, and you heard the phrase economic growth about 50 times in the speech. Um, there are all sorts of measures we're already taking, £22 billion package, including things like council tax rebate, energy bills rebate, all sorts of measures already happening. Well, one's a grant um, and one's a rebate. Well, it? not all of those things need legislation, and this is about that legislative agenda. So the Chancellor's promised more in terms of short-term help. But actually, this is about how do we fix these things in the long term? What's clear, ah. the situation we're now in, uh, is that that spending and that major government intervention through COVID has led to inflation, rising cost of living. We can't just keep, um, you know, keep spending uh, and printing money. So we're going to have to take long-term changes to grow the economy, to support the private sector, help people earn more money, uh, and that will be what rebalances things in the long term. Right, so a government source to the BBC said, yes, we need to stop pain relief and we need to start surgery to bring the economy back to health. Is that how you see it? I don't think it's a case of stopping pain relief. I've, said, I've already talked about £22 billion of, of measures, and the Chancellor's committed to more uh, as we go into the autumn, uh, particularly around energy bills. Um, but it's clear that just short-term chucking money at stuff is not going to fix the fundamental problem. And when you look at the agenda for the last few years, this talk of levelling up, uh, it's about making sure that that economic growth is reflected in all parts of the country, including my own constituency, where people really need the help. Right. Before I come to you, um, Thangham, let's introduce uh, the SNP, Stuart Hosey. Um, Stuart, your thought, your first impression of the bills that have been laid out in the Queen's speech? I will look in considerable detail at all of the bills, whether it ends up being 38 or not. And I would agree that the main challenge here is to tackle the cost of living crisis. But unless it tackles the underlying issues of why energy costs have rocketed £1,000 earlier this year and potentially another £1,000 in the autumn, if it doesn't address the mm. NI hike and the universal credit cut, which is taking money out of the household incomes of those on the most modest spending power, unless it looks at these things as well as well, you know, trying to or, tackle the mm. ongoing productivity issue in this country, then I fear a lot of it might just be window dressing. Right. What would you have liked to have seen specifically then to address those issues? Well, we need to have um, an energy cap uh, or a mechanism which is not funded by loans and which actually works to make energy costs affordable. Uh, I think the UK government still should 
reverse the NI increase and reverse the uh, well, halving of the universal credit uplift removal. I think that would make immediate help. I think there are a number of very practical things like that which I yes, would love to see happen. Absolutely, but it is talking about spending money, isn't it? Spending probably quite sizeable amounts of money uh, to help people pay their bills. How would you pay for that? Well, we had said before a, a, a windfall tax, but not just on energy companies who've made huge profits, uh, but on many other online businesses in particular, the big giants who've done extremely well, not just because of COVID, mm. but as people's shopping and buying habits have changed anyway. You know, I think there's a very strong case for a windfall tax uh, to fund real help, particularly in terms of energy costs. All right. Well, Stuart, you're staying with us for this debate. Um, ben Bradley, what is wrong with a windfall tax when we have seen very clearly those huge profits for the oil and gas companies. Um, Stuart Hosey is right. Energy bills are going to continue to go up, particularly in the autumn. There's nothing in this Queen's speech that's going to help people pay those bills right now. Well, a uh, windfall tax is a, a short-term sticking plaster, isn't it, at the end of the day? It's raised about £4 billion, which is a tiny fraction of the package I've already talked about, the £22 billion we've already put in, alongside the, the normal kind of welfare system, warm homes, um, winter fuel discount and all the other uh, measures that are already in place. But if you want to see um, sustainable, cheaper energy in the future, clearly those businesses need to be able to invest in sustainable and renewable energy. And if you are going to just um, whack uh, massive one-off taxes on them, they're not going to do that or they're not going to do that in this country. Country. Well, so what, again, do you think, well, what do you think of the idea? Well, you say it's a short-term answer, but people are struggling right now to pay their increased bills. They're on fixed incomes. They can't find that extra however many hundreds of pounds they have got to find. Um, the, the boss of Scottish Power yesterday called for households to have their energy bills reduced in October by £1,000. Do you support him? I think it, we need to look at measures that aren't going to have long-term detrimental impacts. And if you just start to throw money at things, inflation will continue, it will get worse. If you look at those kind of windfall tax proposals that will make it harder in the future to reduce and have sustainable energy in this country, that's why um, the Chancellor's not looking at those things. But he has committed to look in the autumn, uh, over the summer and into the autumn, at what more measures he can bring forward. You don't need legislation for that. It doesn't need to be in the Queen's speech. Well, and He's committed to doing and that. And it is true, the Queen's speech isn't necessarily, Thangham, the forum where you would bring forward those sorts of measures. It would be the chance. Uh, coming back at some point. Uh, that phrase that there's been enough pain relief, it's time for the surgery the, econo uh, the economy needs, do you broadly agree with that? I think it's actually extraordinary that Ben is describing this as short-term chucking money at stuff. I mean, the pensioner, who isn't going to get another job because they've already worked all their lives and paid into the system, who is struggling right now to pay their bills and maybe travelling on buses to keep warm or going to the library, that doesn't help them. Just saying there will be long-term economic growth. They need help now. Oh, you're and when I've been talking, when I've been talking, well, at the moment you know perfectly well that one of, at least one of the things you've talked about is a loan. It's not really a grant. You've also failed to insulate the homes. You had several years in which you could have been insulating homes, which would have created jobs, brought people's heating bills down and helped us with climate change. You didn't but do those that. Aren't but saying, those aren't short-term measures no, either, you can do are both. They? You can do a windfall tax. I'm very glad that the SNP has adopted Labour policy on the windfall tax. But a windfall tax which deals with the short-term and long-term investing in renewable energy, insulating our homes and making sure that people who are struggling now don't face a winter in which they're going to be on the breadline, needing more public help, actually, Ben. They will then need even more help. It's lack of th forward thinking, I think, we, unfortunately, we've come to see from this government. When, when there was a cost of living cabinet recently, I mean, all they could come up with is some nonsense ideas about increasing class sizes in nursery schools. It was absolutely risible. All right, well, let's look at Labour's plan. Is it fully costed in the way that Bridget Phillipson, the Shadow Education Secretary, said this morning? <laughs> Well, that's my understanding. And Rachel Rees, who's our Shadow Chancellor, did used to work for the Bank of England. She knows a thing or two about how to add stuff up. All right. Well, in terms of adding stuff up, how would Labour fund the £11 billion that will be raised um, from that national insurance hike? Well, we would. We obviously want to grow the economy, and that's one of the things we would do is by making sure that the economy is growing, as opposed to at the moment where we're at risk of stagflation. We've actually like economy like going speech. backwards. We've got a risk of an economy going backwards at the moment. But you haven't you got know. an actual plan to find that 11 billion pounds that is being raised from those. Some of this would have to be investment. Like... We would have to have. We would have to ah. have capital investment for renewable energy, which would help bring bills down in the medium to long term. And in the short term, one of the things we would do is is, is when you tax people, as the government are doing, we've had 
had 15 Tory tax rises in the last two years, that actually takes money out of the economy. It stops people being able to spend. Not, you know, at the moment they need to spend on the basics, but it also stops them being able to spend on anything else. Is there a point now, um, Camilla, at which the government is deciding to look in the way that Ben's described long term, more long term in terms of fixing the economy? Everyone talks about growth, everybody wants growth, but this idea that actually they are going to try and cut regulation, they are going to try and grow the economy by making it easier for businesses to thrive, but that is in stark contrast to helping people right now with help that they need. Yeah, I think what he tried to provide today is a sort of post-Brexit vision and for him to kind of cash in on his Brexit promises. However, you use some analogies about surgery and mm. pain relief. What some people are needing right now is life support. Mm. Mm. OK, so you've got... Uh, th there's this sense because tax rate bans have been frozen and there are people in higher rate tax rate bans that are going to have to sort of weather this financial storm. But you've got others like Elsie on the bus mm. or indeed the man who set fire to his home because he was burning timber in the front room who are going to need immediate assistance. The other thing is, and I'm a bit baffled by it, there's talk now of an emergency budget. Why didn't Rishi Sunak put in place some of the measures that are needed now? And on the tax burden, I mean... With respect to Thangam, I think that the Labour Party would tax just as highly as the Conservatives. But the Conservatives have lost this low tax mantle because they have done idiotic things like, for instance, raising corporation tax. Nobody in or outside of Brexit circles can understand the idea of making us less competitive than countries like Germany and almost France in the post-Brexit world. So this tax burden is a massive albatross around your neck, not least if readers like our Telegraph readers now associate Thangam with lower taxes than you. <laughs> oh, well, there, 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 there's a change there. I mean, do you think that the government does need to change direction? I will come to you, sorry, Sonia, in just a moment. Change direction in terms of being small, spa small state lower taxes? Oh, yeah, I think Thangam's been pretty clear she would whack a load of extra taxes on where we are now. But um, I, I, I will hold the, the Chancellor's feet to the fire on that. He's made that commitment um, to reduce taxes, to change uh, the nature of government. Tory tax rises uh, in two you years, know, I'm a, a small 15. C, small state 15. Conservative. Well, I want to see going? us change the, the mantra on all of that. But COVID has been what it has been, uh, and it's a very different scenario we now find ourselves in. I hope that the, some of the, what's in this Green speech, particularly the Brexit freedom stuff and supporting the private sector to invest and to grow, is what then allows us to take that Conservative approach and to say right over to you grow the economy and create jobs and, and support people so I think there are two major issues with the government's approach to cost of living so the first is as Camilla says there's that lack of immediate support and I think we need to put that in context so that those billions that you talked about they are spread very thinly across the vast bulk of the population they're not targeted at people who need the help the most if you look at the last decade Government support, that safety net for low paid parents and minimum wage jobs, you know, jobs that don't pay enough to do everything that you need to do for your kids, that has been ebbed away and some families have lost thousands of pounds in tax credits and that's been made worse by the universal credit cut. Then the energy support is focused very thinly so I think that needs to change. The focus on the long term stuff, that's mm. all very well and good but my god governments have been trying to grow the economy and sort out differences in, in, the, in the regional gap in growth for a very long time. We know the macroeconomic evidence suggests that the way to do that is to boost investment. Is that what levelling up is and that was obviously that part is... of it and deregulating Post Brexit, but I don't. So I don't think deregulation is the way to grow our Why? economy. There's, because there's not much evidence that there's a lot of there's a lot of leeway to give in terms of when you're talking about deregulating, you're talking about cutting back on things like employment protection, for example. You know, minimum wage protection. These are really important protections for people. The way we know, if we look at countries like Germany, for example, the way to grow the economy is to make sure we've got good levels of regional investment, and the way to do that is through government investment in those areas and that's just not what's happened over the last 12 years. That. There's no, we can all argue for more government spending and government should build this and, and create that but government doesn't create jobs, the private sector creates jobs and we've already got things in train, come to my region um, the East Midlands Freeport, East Midlands Development Corporation that are all about attracting private sector investment in higher skilled higher paid jobs to a region that is traditionally the bottom of those investment tables, that's exactly what we're trying to do. Well Stuart and wouldn't that look like post Brexit freedoms boosting the economy and the private sector? Well, I'm not sure about post-Brexit freedoms and levelling up. We saw the information in the last few days that 28 of the levelling up funding bids from the poorest parts of England had been rejected. But I think the general tenor of this is you can do the short-term help and the long-term strategic stuff at the same time. And I, I saw it described at the weekend as changes to the supply side of the economy. Now, 
If that means, and let me give one small example, helping agriculture. Agricultural buildings allowance reintroduction, for example, food production, processing, refrigeration, warehousing, logistics. I would welcome that. The problem is, as we just heard, when the Tories talk about supply side changes, they almost always mean taking an axe to workers' terms and conditions. That would simply make things worse. Well, you're shaking your head, Ben. Oh, just make some wild leaps of assumptions about what would be the worst possible thing we could think of and let's pretend that that's what they're doing. Nobody the said that, have yeah, they? Where's the employment bill? What are you going yeah. to deregulate? You were going to have an employment bill in the last Queen's speech, didn't have one, then where is it now? I mean, you aren't protecting workers' rights. Well, let, let him answer. No, what we've, are, got to, what... we've got to support business to invest. We've already started to do and that. We see um, the kind of changes where um, Rishi the Chancellor is allowing businesses to invest more in technology, to invest more uh, in growing their business and tax reliefs on all of that. That helps them uh, to be more productive. We talked about the productivity problem in this country, it also means that jobs in those businesses end up being higher paid, higher skilled, rather than those frontline low paid workers. Well, in these millions, we've got loads of those, we don't need more of those. Sonia what brought up the example of Germany. And you know, what, what we have there is a country which knows that you get higher paid, higher skilled workers when they are properly protected and they have decent employment rights. You have no employment bill in this Queen's speech. Where is it? <laughs> where is it? There where is, no, where is protection for workers? I our see employment it not. rights in this country are pretty damn good. Yeah, actually, thanks to Labour governments, but you've been eroding um, them. And you said that there was going to be, your party said there was going to be an employment bill. There is no employment bill. So what's in it for workers? Where is the onshore wind? Workers? Where's the commitment to onshore wind? There's where's an energy the bill that's in there. You're just yeah, making guesses about on, what's in there. Is it going to have onshore wind? What's wind in there for it? workers is, is investment in better paid jobs, high skilled economy in places like the East Midlands, where traditionally we've had none of that, where we've really struggled for that, and where that investment, public and private sector, is the lowest the opportunity to invest but in Ben, you're like talking that about that investment gap which growth. is really important huge investment gap but you know the conservatives have been in government for 12 years mm. the prime minister has been though, there for two so the point though, know, Fangham, that different i think the windfall tax that Stuart and you are advocating you must accept that that is going to put off big businesses from investing further in britain and also you put a tax on them where are they going to derive that money from you think they're just going to give up part of their profits and not actually take away workers wages or indeed make that people redundant to, they have the, they have the, the big businesses who they run the oil and gas companies. Some of them are already saying that actually it isn't going to put them off. Others of them are openly boasting about the fact that they've got a huge amounts of profit. That's what we have to do at a time of crisis. It is a time of national crisis. The cost of living crisis is a crisis for working people who are going to struggle to keep the m money going through their, their their fuel bill to pay their fuel bills. For pensioners who are travelling on buses, you have to get the money. And there from is somewhere. a 22 billion pound package and a which is, includes a loan. Right. Well, hang on, Stuart. The, the the Labour Party hasn't just been criticising the government, the Scottish Labour Party says that you would have a lot more money, you being the SNP, would have a lot more money to help uh, spending on people with the cost of living in Scotland if you hadn't spent or wasted, as they say, a quarter of a billion pounds on failed ferry contracts. Well, They're I mean, right. This is the same Labour Party who are demanding we save the Ferguson shipyard. We've saved the Ferguson shipyard. It is immensely disappointing that for mm. a variety of reasons these ferries are behind time and over budget, but they're being built and right now, all the islands are being serviced by ferries. These ferries will see service, albeit a little late. Mm. I think the Labour Party I really need to get consistent. And it's that kind of attack for the sake of it line that they keep coming out with that led them to their second worst ever council results last Thursday. Right. I mean, they would say, of course, they overtook the Conservatives to get to second place. But you're absolutely right. They didn't make a dent in the SNP's electoral success. But on the failed ferry uh, contracts, mm. you say it's a little late. Um, in terms of being over budget, you have wasted that money. Well, the money's not wasted. Well, the ferries will see the light of day. They when, will when, go into when will service. They see, when will they see the light of day? Well, I, I'm hoping they'll see uh, service as quickly as is humanly possible. But mm. don't misunderstand me. It is, and I'll be gentle here, inordinately disappointing mm. that they haven't been completed <laughs> on time so far. Right, yes, I can hear your disappointment coming through loud and clear. Stuart Hosey, thank you very much uh, for joining us. We're, we're going to move on. Yesterday, the leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, said this. I believe in honour, integrity and the principle that those who make the laws must follow them. And I believe that politicians who undermine that principle, undermine trust in politics, undermine our democracy and undermine Britain. I'm absolutely clear that no laws were broken. They were followed at all times.
Right. That was Keir Starmer responding to the fact that uh, uh, they're being investigated for an event in Durham last year by the Durham police uh, where curry was eaten and beer was drunk. Um, what do you think about Keir Starmer's gamble? Because it is a gamble, isn't it? I think it was actually quite a smart move and I, th I find it hard to see actually what else he could have done because mm. I think if he was issued, if he is, it's obviously a hypothetical, but if he were to get a fixed penalty notice from the police, given the strong stance he's taken about the government and Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak getting fined, I do sort of think that he would have to resign mm. or lose credibility. So I think then the question is, well, why not get ahead of it, come out in front and say that's what you will do? I think that puts more pressure on Johnson. I think if he had hadn't said this, every single interview he'd have done over the next few weeks while Durham police are investigating, he would have been asked a question, well, yes, you say you haven't broken the rules, but if you were to get a fine, would you resign? So I think that puts that to bed. And I also think the Labour Party are probably pretty confident by the sounds of things that he's not going to get so, fined but... because I think they didn't break the law. I mean, it is, going to, we know. it is going to pile pressure on Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak, isn't it, Camilla? Especially if more fines are issued by the Metropolitan Police. And the government will want to downplay this whole saga. Of course. But you say, what else could he have done? He could have answered a number of unanswered questions about all this. He's the sort of self-styled high priest of politics, Saint Starmer, who does no wrong. In which case, can we please have an answer to the following questions? Why did the Labour Party lie about Angela Rayner being there until CCTV footage revealed that she was? They, of course, said it was a mistake. Why did they lie about it being impromptu when a memo has now emerged suggesting that it was pre-planned? Why did they suggest that they couldn't get food at the Radisson Blue when they could? Can we have some clarification as to whether they did go back to work or not? Can we have a response to the Politico story suggesting that people who were at the dinner were actually drunk and not working? All right. Can we also have some clarification, which he didn't give yesterday? He tweeted in January... If um, the Prime Minister is investigated by the police, he must resign. So if he's holding himself to higher standards than he's holding um, everybody, why doesn't he now resign because he called for the Prime Minister well, to do on the basis of a police investigation? Well, let's see if we can get answers to some of those questions because we have Thangham here. Well, let me pick a few. Yeah. So, an ops note which was revealed, you know, big reveal by an operational note at the weekend. In my experience, the leader of the opposition or any, any lead politician on a visit like that, they're not the one in charge of the operational notes. They're the one doing the work. They're the one talking to people. Yes, of course he went back to work afterwards. That's what Keir does. He works incredibly hard. Just because that wasn't written on the operational note doesn't mean it didn't happen. Did everyone go Just, to work afterwards? I, I, I wasn't there, so I don't know who was there and who didn't go back to work and who didn't, but I do know that Keir did, because that's the kind of man he do, he is. That's what he does. An operational note, you know, that came to light recently again, as I said. Um, that's not usually the thing that the politician even looks at. They're not the ones but in Louise charge of Haig it. said this was an impromptu thing, so it's different from well, it felt that way because it was impromptu. It can't be if an op note... I mean, I've, I've got op notes coming out of my ears. I cover yeah. the royals and politics. Yeah, probably felt Wait to Keir. Op, op notes make a plan, and the plan was to get mm -hmm. a curry. So it wasn't I a last-minute decision. I, I do. He's allowed it. to eat. Of course, he is. There wasn't it, a rule against Thangam, eating. Doesn't like, matter where like, he eats. As with Boris Johnson. Wasn't against okay, the rules. The trouble with putting yourself on a pedestal that mm -hmm. high is that there's even yeah. further to fall. What's annoyed the public about this, and I think they're absolutely over all of it. They don't think the police should necessarily be wasting their time, and that the rules were absolutely ridiculous in the first place. It's the obfuscation. You can't be a bastion of the truth and then be caught in a lie. Right. He's not lying. Well, let me, just, really well let me just show you um, this tweet. Um, this is from the 31st of January from Keir Starmer. Honesty and decency matter. After months of denials, the Prime Minister is now under criminal investigation for breaking his own lockdown laws. This was before the fixed penalty notice was issued. He needs to do the decent thing and resign. Isn't that a problem, Sonia? Because... To some extent, Camilla is right. He's not holding himself to the same standard that he certainly set out for the Prime Minister and Rishi Sunak. Well, I think, I mean, it definitely has the appearance of a problem. I, personally, I feel that there's a difference, a qualitative difference between... Um, what we know about the event that he was at and what we know about what was going on in Downing Street, which was, you know, people being brought together for a birthday sing-song, emails going around from very senior Downing Street officials saying it's lovely weather, let's all get together outside. And then, you know, leaving parties where people were getting drunk and there was karaoke. And this was a whole year earlier when things were much worse in the pandemic. I think it's conceivable and that the rules were not broken. So I think that's what makes the situation very 
different, but it does, he, I mean, he has created a rod for his own back. And to the point about Labour sort of changing the story, I do think that's an issue, actually. I think it's been poorly handled. My personal view in reading of it is not that they're lying and that they're, they're deliberately trying to obfuscate, but just that they didn't handle this right and they didn't, you know, they didn't take the time to investigate and understand what happened. And I think if Keir Starmer was really going to get ahead of this, he would have brought, you know, if someone in the Labour Party would have brought all the information together and handed it over to the police proactively and they would have made sure that they understood what had happened. And I think it's, it was a, it, it's mistakes, but it's very poor handling. On the court issue, though, there is no comparison, is there, really, Ben there Bradley? It, in terms of the scale, in terms of the sort of premeditated um, claims that are made by a whole list of events, up to 12 events at, at Downing Street, that is about culture, mm. isn't it, um, at the top from Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak? Different to this campaigning event in Durham um, where, well, we will see. The argument will be around, was it reasonably acceptable for work? Uh, this one that we know about, but it's incredible the level of, of well, hypocrisy. Well, let, let's, let's talk uh, about the ones we know about. Incredible the level of hypocrisy when we can sit here making uh, exactly the same argument that I sat here making about the Prime Minister um, earlier in the year, going, well, um, you know, he gets his agenda and he's led around number 10 and he wouldn't know, and it's exactly the argument. He knows what a birthday cake making. is. They were parties, um, there were suitcases full but of But that's the point, isn't it? it? It's not about that's honour a party. and truth. It's because Kim Starmer has backed himself into strict. a corner and he's no. got nowhere to go. Absolutely. All right. Because he either... He either stays, in which case he loses all credibility for not holding himself to the same standard that he's demanded of the Prime Minister, or he goes, in which case he's gone. End I don't think that's true, actually. I think yeah. if the police don't find him, I think this this will yeah. effectively put that to bed. I am not at all clear about that. The different difference to me is that the Prime Minister ultimately has held his hands up, said, yes, I accept responsibility. This is a cultural problem in Number 10. And he's made changes But he said there were no 10. parties. Well, he said there were no parties. He said there were no parties. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. That actually, sometimes people make mistakes. Sometimes people don't communicate behind the scenes effectively. Sometimes administration goes wrong. That will be fine if that's what Keir Starmer had said about the. Okay, Prime so the cultural so is he's actually been found guilty. He has been found guilty, and he's still the prime investigation minister. Investigation ongoing. That's Let's come massive. back to that. Well, let me let me just take Ben through um, the response to what Keir Starmer has done, which is he has stated very clearly that if he is issued with a fixed penalty notice, then he will step down. Are the prime minister and chancellor showing a lack of honour and? integrity by not saying uh, that they would resign or should resign now. They have been issued with a fixed penalty notice. There is a contrast with how Keir Starmer is handling this. Only because he's got to, because he's been so vehement about the, the, how the Prime Minister should approach this. In reality, he's now uh, possibly going to be found guilty of exactly the same thing. But in truth, um, the, we, for all the reasons we've just talked about, with all the things going on mm. in the world, the Ukraine, cost of living, Camilla's talked about people being fed up of this, I think the, the Prime Minister is quite right to make the changes he needs to make and then crack on with dealing with the real issues that people really want to see him How tackle. do you respond, Thangham, to this charge of hypocrisy? the fact that he isn't keeping to his own standards that he set the Prime Minister and Rishi Sunak. We're talking about a contrast between night and day. We're talking about someone here who has literally been in charge of the criminal but law he said if you he were investigated, director of public prosecutions. But if you were investigated by the police, I mean, he said in that tweet, honesty and decency matter after months of denials, the Prime Minister is now under criminal investigation for breaking his own lockdown laws. Mm -hmm. Well, Keir Starmer is now under investigation for breaking uh, lockdown laws. Should he resign? Well, I think he's already said that he's going to resign if he's found guilty. At this point, I think we're dancing on the head of a pin here. There's a clear well, contrast between somebody who has already been found to have been at illegal parties in the first lockdown, around the time when, when, when people were really, really struggling, and somebody who was on a campaign visit, which is a work visit, and stopping to eat. There's all the difference in the world. He has said he will resign if he's found if he, he is found to have broken the rules, but he is a man of principle, and I think that's in stark contrast to Boris Johnson. Do you think it was a bit unfair when it came to Rishi Sunak? because he is saying that Rishi Sunak, who claims he accidentally stumbled on this uh, birthday... Stumbled on a cake. Uh, stumbled on a cake, stumbled <laughs> on, a, on a birthday party, but still Keir Starmer said just for being investigated he should go. Well, I think when you walk into a room and there's cake and there's people drinking wine, you know it's a party. All right, well, that's fair enough. Do you think Keir Very Starmer's put undue pressure on Durham police over this? Of course not. I mean, I'm related to at least one police officer. I know plenty of others. They're pretty, really good at being able to withstand any sort of thing like this. They know what they're doing. We need to let them get on with their job. They know exactly what they're doing. They will come to a conclusion, and we should all respect that. I did a Labour staffer brief the papers yesterday that... 
he hoped that it would put pressure on Durham um, police. I genuinely don't know what you're talking about, Camilla. No, that's in all of the press, isn't it, Sonia? Somebody was briefing the papers yesterday from the Labour side saying, well, you know, it could be quite handy, this, because it puts pressure on Durham police. So is that mis him misusing his power as a former well, it's DPP? An anonymous per it's an anonymous briefer. It's a Labour, it's a Labour source. A Labour source. Which was also briefed into the left-wing press as well as the right-wing press. So let's well, not just you might find that some more mischief making. No, no, I don't think it is, Thangam. Clearly, their intention is to put a bit of pressure on Durham well, police. I is that Durham appropriate? police are well capable of withstanding political pressure. All right, well let's, well, let's leave it with uh, Durham police. Um, we're going to talk about this headline in The Guardian. Uh, Priti Patel, the Home Secretary, blames lawyers as she admits Rwanda plan will take time. Home Secretary attacks specialist lawyers as Labour calls delayed plan little more than a press release. Um, this is uh, the reports, actually, that two asylum seekers have launched a legal challenge to the policy. Uh, this is for asylum seekers to be deported to Rwanda, where they will then or can lodge uh, their applications to stay in Rwanda, not in the UK. The lawyers will use judicial review, which is a way to challenge the lawfulness of a decision made by a public body to try and block their clients from being sent to Rwanda. Lawyers are planning to use the same argument, if you remember, as Gina Miller did when she blocked Theresa May from triggering Article 50 and therefore the process for Brexit without a parliamentary vote. Is there a problem here of lawyers trying to interfere with government policy, Ben? Consistently. And when you've got um, a government elected on a huge mandate, um, that legal reform was in our 29 man 2019 manifesto. Tackling illegal immigration was in our 2019 manifesto. We won big in that election, got a huge mandate from the country to deliver on those things. Mm. Uh, and each time uh, we take steps forward in that, we're dragged back by a, a judicial process and by people who then are effectively trying to thwart that democratic Or are they decision. just doing their jobs, Ben? Well, you can't have it both ways. In, and we've had the debates on Rwanda a few weeks ago where we've been saying, you know, Labour was saying, just process people faster, just get people through the system faster. And then every time we process... I think that sounds like a pretty but good solution But then every time, every time we process people faster, then we have people going, well, you're you've, not processing. you've made you're not a decision. Can I finish my point? You've made, hang on, hang on. you've made a decision about um, rejecting that claim. Now you can't deport them. Now we're dragging them off the plane. No, now no, we're not deporting not, criminals. Uh, this is so not about work. people whose, uh, whose, whose asylum claims have been rejected. Don't talk over each other. Let's finish this point and then, Sonia, I'll let you come in. Fundamentally, there has to be major intervention in this asylum system to make it work. Otherwise, you'll continue to have hundreds of people coming across the channel, people dying uh, in uh, that, the channel every day, uh, and it's not sustainable. It's not the right thing to do. So there has to be that deterrent, and there has to be a different system that can ensure that we can change that. And if you've got no alternative plan, which Labour hasn't, which we no have, plan at all, which come to in a minute, and you know I can't plan, it's not the plan. There's that no that place to criticise. Is, is this political you know interference by lawyers, effectively? No, I think it's a system working as it ought. We do have a sort of constitutional framework in this country where courts interpret human rights legislation, the law, and um, if the government does things that are unlawful, they are held to account in the courts. But I just want to come back to it. Ben's point, because Ben actually got his own policy wrong there. He's, he said that this was about deporting people whose asylum claims have been rejected in the not. UK. It's not. Actually, it's not. the government only deports around 200 people whose yes. asylum claims are rejected. Because that lawyers isn't... drag them off. No, 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 hang on, it's, hang on, it's, hang on. It's not that, Ben. It's not that. And what we're talking about here is something very materially different. It is people with legitimate claims mm. for asylum from places uh, no. like Syria, <laughs> from on, Ukraine, on, I'm gonna, I being forced... In this no, 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 there well. is... Being France. forcibly deported to Rwanda. It's a really shocking policy and lots of lawyers think but it actually breaks international law and, it, and it goes against the spirit of the Refugee well, Convention. Well, Ben, you respond first. These are people arriving from a safe country, uh, illegally entering this country, and Labour's argument against Well, they're this coming Rwanda. here by, by what you would call illegal means, having paid people smugglers to get but they here. Are they, they themselves are funding an industry that is literally killing people. Uh, and you uh, had a, a scenario again in the debate a few weeks ago where Labour were arguing uh, that we should treat people who arrive here through legal and legitimate means in the same way as we treat people who arrive on small boats in Dover. But, but ben, it's absolutely we take unbelievable. It's a fundamental few... issue of fairness. Oh, but you, do, well, you know that... how you're treating people who arrive here legally and, and present to make asylum claims. I have, I, as an MP, I've had seven years of dealing with the highest number of immigration caseload, as according to your minister, by the way, mm. of any MP. And I can tell you what's happening. The number of Home Office officials available, they're all doing a fine job, but the delays that the Home Office itself puts in are extraordinary. Right, you okay. haven't met your Home Office 
so you do back. Six months. So you do six back months lawyers you're supposed taking to. judicial course, review to because do this. lawyers okay. are there to do a job. Right. Lawyers are there. It's extraordinary for a lawmaker to criticise those people who are actually trying to make sure that the job of, of the lawyer, the, the lawyer who is trying to make sure the law is properly obeyed. It's really extraordinary to criticise lawyers for doing the their and job. Do that, and it's right. lawyers' jobs to try and make sure that the law is properly I mean, applied. isn't judicial review, Camilla, an important tool in holding the government accountable? Yeah. I mean, I'm a former student of the law. I studied law at university. And, of course, everyone um, deserves a right to legal representation. I think in this case, sometimes it's the law that's an ass rather than the lawyers themselves. There's a conflation here because the government's still really angry about the likes of Jolly and Morm and others trying to reverse the referendum with their own legal um, chicanery. This is a bit different, and I think it's the legislation. From the public's point of view, they've got sympathy with people legitimately seeking asylum. I think if they see stories like rapists and murderers are on a plane to be deported and then lawyers come in and start fighting for their human that's not rights. What we're talking about here. No, but but some, that's what the public yeah. perceives this to be. Sure. And the public says, hang on a minute, what about the human rights of their victims? Why are lawyers being able to cash in on the misery of others but, by trying to remove these people from got, planes? What we've mostly got is people who've got a legitimate asylum claim that needs to be processed and properly assessed to see if it is genuine or not, facing years of delays before they even get to a decision to appeal against Ben. Way beyond. To process legitimate claims by people who have arrived through legitimate means if you weren't having to deal with 400 people a day coming across on you boats. Obviously don't. All right. now, hang on, hang on. Camilla has raised this issue, um, Thangham, about legitimate concerns, about the motivation mm. of judicial review and when it is used. Do you understand that? I understand the questions and the concerns, of course, but I also think it's very important that even if the public says we're concerned about this, that lawyers are properly scrutinising the application of the law and yeah. then eventually courts will make so a decision. So should it be reformed? Oh, well, I, I think there's an awful lot I'd like to do to reform the asylum and immigration system, but starting with review. making sure well, it, that we actually have staffing to make those assessments at a t in a timely manner so that people who aren't entitled to asylum are deported correctly, but also those that are, are given the support that they should be given. And that's not right. happening at the moment. Well, let's have a look at this uh, promise in the Conservative Party manifesto of 2019. We will ensure that judicial review is available to protect the rights of the individuals against an overbearing state while ensuring that it is not abused to conduct politics by another means or to create needless delays. Why has the government dropped those plans to reform judicial review from the Queen's speech? Well, there was a Bill of Rights uh, in there that I think probably touches on some of that, uh, language aside. But um, you can argue about whether this is politics or whatever. There's clearly a need for um, uh, checking that the law is being applied. I totally agree. But there are also countless examples of where the law has been uh, used in a political way, not least the referendum, not least um, examples of pulling um, you know, uh, criminals off of planes uh, uh, for deportation. That's pure politics. Right, and so that I'm, can't be allowed to continue. I mean, is judicial review abused in a way that it is politics by another means? I mean, I think if you look at some of the judicial reviews that have happened over the last, uh, you know, sort of five or six years, there have been some really important cases, such as the finding that some of the government's policies around the hostile environment are actually racially discriminatory. And then there have been some unsuccessful, more political cases. Um, and I can that is clearly what the government is concerned about. But the whole point about the law is that... You know, there are always going to be some cases that may be taken with malintent that don't succeed. That is just the way the legal system works. So you can't reform the system so you only get the things that are going to be successful in the courts. Like, you kind of have to take the rough with the smooth. Are you worried then, Ben, that uh, legal challenges or judicial review will impact the Rwanda policy going forward? It will never actually happen. I think it will happen, but I think it will certainly be uh, an impact. The, the challenge to me is that there is a huge democratic mandate for these kinds of reforms and changes to a system that were tantamount, were foremost in people's minds uh, at the general election through the referendum. But there's no uh, mandate this, for this. It wasn't in your manifesto, in Ben. It's quite just obvious. Wasn't. We said that we would tackle illegal immigration. We said that, that we would give reform you carte judicial to do review. We've introduced um, the uh, Nationality and Borders Bill that's had huge majorities through the Commons in recent weeks, and that's what facilitates this Rwanda plan. Uh, it goes down incredibly well with All right, constituents. We've only got a few seconds. Do you think this Rwanda plan will ever actually get off the ground? Probably not, no. Oh, right. Well, that really was uh, <laughs> that really was short and sweet. Thank you to all of my guests for joining me today on the state opening of Parliament. I will be back tomorrow at 12.15 with more Politics Live. From all of us here, have a very good afternoon. Bye-bye.